Tonight's episode starts very early in the morning along this blue dash line and it's going diagonally across this intersection. The diagonal line actually goes through that IGA grocery store, goes across the intersection, and goes diagonally through the other building acro diagonally across from the IGA. That blue line separates Georgia from Tennessee. I remember the last time I was here, and you can go all the way back to my very first video on YouTube when I stopped here on the way to the Lost Sea. But today I'm starting my cross country road trip. I'll be driving through seven states, ending in San Diego, California. But that all starts right here in Copper Hill, Tennessee. Hey guys, it's Emily. Welcome everyone. I'm starting my cross country road trip. It's very early and very cold. It's actually 26 degrees out right now. I'll be driving through seven states, starting with Tennessee. It'll take seven days to travel west, and I'll visit a state each day. And I should reach California on the seventh day. It's gonna be a very long trip, so let's go. I'll be filming my entire trip on two cameras capable of 4K at 60 frames per second. I'll probably use my new DJI Osmo Pocket 3, and for a video while driving, I use my GoPro Black 9. But first, let's see where I'm going. Overall, I'll be driving through seven states and discovering one state each day as I drive across the country. On this video, I'll focus on Tennessee, starting at the state line at Copper Hill, then making my way generally northwest. Then somewhat follow the Interstate 40 corridor and ending my day in Memphis. I'm getting some gas and the price here is $2.59 a gallon. I'll also be documenting what price of gas is as I travel across the country. This gas station is in the northern suburbs of Chattanooga. My next stop is at College Dale. This looks like a newer suburb of Chattanooga. I'm at Little Debbie Park, which opened a few months ago. It is very near to the Little Debbie factory, also located in Collegedale. We're all familiar with Little Debbie, the brand that makes all the tasty snack cakes that are not good for you, but they taste so good. Anyway, this park features playground replicas of those tasty treats. And here's one of those replicas. This Christmas tree snack cake replica is about 6 feet tall. I've seen a lot of social media posts showing people posing next to this tree, and I'm no exception. Here's a good size play area in the park for the children to play. It's a little early and very cold right now. It's about 7.30 in the morning and about 20 de 28 degrees right now. Definitely cool and crisp weather right now. Here's another playground replica of the Little Debbie Snack Cake. This brownie with the, the little candy dots. This one I can see children climbing on top of and it might be through the opening down below. Here's another look at the brownies as Mama and I get in position to take a still photo. Actually, these brownies have buy marks in them. I bet more adults like to get their pictures with the snack cakes at this park. Look over here, there's a bunch of large acorns. You can also see how frosty the fake grass is right here. It's cold now, but it'll get much warmer this afternoon. That looks like some twisty climbing structure. There's also playground equipment, and I bet lots of kids live in this area. There's so many homes and apartments near here. Here's another playground replica of a little Debbie snack. This one is the oatmeal cream pie. And I know my parents have had these in their lunch boxes when they were kids. There's also a concrete walkway that encircles this park. This is great for people that want to take a brisk walk and get their steps in. I'm not sure how long the path is. I'm guessing a quarter of a mile. Here's another playground replica of a sweet treat. These classic wafer cookies are covered with chocolate and they probably have peanut butter. 
for the filling between the wafers. And after looking at these little Debbie snacks, you can buy the real thing at the factory outlet store not far from here. There are also a few pavilions in the park where you can have a picnic or a get together with your friends and enjoy a day at the park. At the other end of the park is a brief history of the Little Debbie Company. I guess I went the wrong way around the park since we're starting with the markers featuring the toy tents of the 2020s and beyond. This marker features many of the Little Debbie snack cakes that you can buy at your grocery store or the nearby factory outlet. The same marker has the 1990s and 2000s decade on its reverse, so the brownie playground replica I saw earlier was called a Cosmic Brownie and was created in response to the Cosmic Bowling turn from 30 years ago. I remember eating some of these little Debbie treats with my friends Maddie and Charlotte when we did our Halloween and Christmas food taste tests. In the 1980s, this marker said Little Debbie became the number one manufacturer of snack cakes in the United States. I believe it. I see them all the time near the checkouts at Walmart. In the 1970s, this marks the quote, groovy new snacks, unquote, that Little Debbie created, and many of them are still available today. Like the Chocolate Star Crunch, Fudge Runs, Devil's Food Cake Squares, and those Peanut Butter Logs. They all taste good but are not really good for you. Back in the 1960s, the McKee Baking Company created the Little W brand. They created a number of snacks out of the new brand, such as these pancake type of snacks marketed as quick breakfast and other snacks such as cream rolls and nutty chocolate bars were introduced to the American grocery stores. In the 1950s, the McKee Baking Company was created after the owners bought King's Bakery in Chattanooga. Just a few years later, the company moved to what was a missionary college right here in Collegedale and they converted the college into a plant. In exchange, the students were given opportunities to work at the converted plant. Over the next eight years, that plant expanded 13 times. The last marker features the 1940s on this side. The marker goes over the very beginnings of the McKee family's bakery business when they still lived in Charlotte, North Carolina. This marker also stresses the need for the entire family to pitch in however they can. And finally on the opposite side is the 1930s and actually earlier when they sold cakes from the back of their Whippet vehicle in 1928 and they expanded to reach Jack's Cookie Company. The expansion was impressive considering the United States was in the middle of the Great Depression. And here's a bronze statue of Little Debbie herself. Little Debbie was inspired by the granddaughter of the founder. Her name was Debbie McKee Fowler. Today, she is the executive vice president and also on the board of directors. The McKee family donated 10 acres of property to, to create this park. This is a different way to park. The sign has directions for visitors to park their cars. You back into a parking space when you arrive here instead of backing out of the space when you leave. Some other fun facts about the Little Debbie Company. They sell nearly a billion cartons of Little Debbie snacks every year. This company bought Drake's in 2013 when I went bankrupt. They made green dings, yolos, devil dogs, and small coffee cakes. This is a nice park and also a nice area in the Chattanooga area. Also, the Factory Alice store is nearby if you want to buy some of their sweet treats. Now heading west on Interstate 24, and look at that train crossing right over us on that tall bridge. We're making our way to Nashville. Something interesting about the stretch of Interstate 24 just south of the city of Monteagle. Notice it has an appearance of a one-way road as we make our way westbound and uphill. 
The eastbound lanes are actually over a mile away, which is the largest median in the interstate highway system. The second largest median is located on Interstate 8 near the Desert View Tower in California, which we'll see in six days. Take a look at this really tall rock cliffs they created when they constructed this road. Now I'm not far from Nashville, I guess I'm about 30 minutes away. I'm in the city of Murfreesboro. At the end of this road is Middle Tennessee State University. I've been here before, but it looks like they've created these new townhomes since then, where I had to park since the small parking area has been blocked off. I'm paying another visit to the obelisk, which denotes the Geographic Center of Tennessee. This obelisk was dedicated on June 26, 1976. In the early 1800s, it took many years to determine the precise geographic center of the state, as the state wanted to place the state capital in the town where the geographic center was located. So from 1819 to 18. 25, Murfreesboro was the state capital. The capital wasn't moved again until 1843 when it was settled that Nashville was going to be the state capital. This flag on the obelisk has been replaced a couple of times. Do any of you have any idea why someone would want to steal this plaque? There's a different plaque than the first time I was here. I had a picture of Tennessee and a red star in the exact center. Maybe the new plaque would be just text would be less um, desirable to steal. The Zabos was commissioned by the Rufford County Historical Society. They wanted something to commemorate during the United States Bicentennial Celebration, so they chose to install this monument. We've also been in the geographic center of Alabama and Georgia, as well as the center of the 48 contiguous states, which is in Kansas, and the center of all 50 U.S. states, which is in North Dakota. It looks like they're putting in a new sidewalk, so the small parking area is blocked off temporarily. The obelisk is about two miles east of the Middle of Tennessee State University. As for me, I'm on to my next stop. But first, a quick weather report. The temperature has gone up 20 degrees since this morning. It's now 47 degrees. My next stop is in Nashville. More specifically, the economy parking section of the Nashville airport. I'm driving out to California, but I'll be flying back, so I'm leaving our car here and getting a rental car. But first, I have to take the shuttle bus to the terminal. And from the terminal, we're heading to the rental car counter to get an SUV to drive all the way to California. We got a decent deal on a one-way rental. And not only that, we usually don't prepay the fuel, which means I bring back the car with an empty tank. But they charge me the Tennessee gas price, which is about half the price of the California price. The plus we're bringing this car back to the LA external facility at about 3 a.m. on New Year's Day, and I don't really want to be getting gas in that area in the middle of the night. It took a while from the time we parked our car to get at the airport to the time we drove out of the rental car facility, but we still have plenty of time. So we're heading to downtown Nashville to see Broadway and then a couple of other roadside attractions. We haven't been to Nashville in several years since a family friend of ours had her baby shower. I think that child is about five years old now, so yeah, it's been a little while. And the traffic on the interstate is really bad, but thankfully on the side streets is pretty clear right now, driving into downtown. The main entertainment district is along Broadway, where it ends with the Cumberland River. This is also the starting point for the annual Rock and Roll Marathon, held on the last Saturday in April. I have a family member that ran the half marathon three times, and a brother of our family friend ran the half one time. There are lots of restaurants, bars, and musical venues along this road. 
Also, there are a number of prominent businesses such as Amazon that have moved into downtown Nashville, making this a very popular destination for people that want to visit and live here. Still on Broadway, near Vanderbilt University, is something I'm not sure is the world's largest, but it's pretty big. This is 16 foot tall whisk, and it doubles as a bike rack. That's pretty cool. I'm standing next to it, and you can see it's probably three times as tall as me. So why is there a giant whisk here? This isn't next to a cooking school, so it just seems random that it's here. Since 2009, Nashville has installed 21 artistic black racks throughout the city, including this woods. Other examples of bike racks in other locations in Nashville are decorated in the shape of giant locks, a handlebar mustache, a field of corn, and slices of tomato. The wood sculpture is called Good Eats and was created by Wayne Henderson in 2015. The sculpture is located on Broadway and its intersection with 21st Avenue near Vanderbilt's Law School and the Air Sun Midtown Mixed Use Development. So come on by and check it out. Okay, with all the talk about the whisk and cooking and whatnot, I'm gonna grab some lunch and then head to my next destination. By the way, what exactly is a whatnot? Now heading west on Interstate 40, I'm heading to a city with a very famous name, which has a landmark you'd expect from that city. Welcome to Paris. Paris, Tennessee, that is. They even have their own Eiffel Tower, and it's even decorated for Christmas. This tower is pretty tall also. I'm standing in front of it to give you an idea of how tall this is. The Eiffel Tower is 70 feet tall, and this is 1 the size of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. This tower was originally built with wood from Douglas fir trees and reinforced with thousands of steel rods. The structure was dedicated in 1993. The structure you see today is a replacement made with steel. Here are some markers on this iron fence. The zero structure was fabricated and erected in 2002 by precision grinding and machine. The concrete base was renovated in 2015 by Lowe's. I guess that's the Lowe's home improvement store in town. I also noticed people have love locks on this fence. These markers show other places to visit in Paris, Tennessee, and I'll show you some of them later in this video. On the right is the listing of points of interest. On the left, the circular marker, is a map of the same attractions. Looks like we're just outside the downtown area, where I'll go in just a few minutes. Right now I'm at number one, Eiffel Tower Park, which is not only the tower, but a splash pad. Number two is downtown Paris, which has a few things to see, such as the downtown square and some painted murals. Some other things include going to the lake, restaurants, and the nearby wildlife refuge. Even the dumpster is decorated for the splash pad area of the park. And here's the splash pad which is open from May to September. It costs $2 per person, except for Memorial Day weekend, which is free. The centerpiece of the splash pad are some small slides with its own Eiffel Tower in the middle. While I've been here, there have been many couples and families getting some pictures of themselves with the Eiffel Tower. Always great to get those fun pics. There's a couple right now, just as I'm leaving. Also, the Christmas decorations are great, with Santa making his way up the Eiffel Tower with gifts. I have a spoiler alert, but this won't be the only town named Paris that I'll visit on my cross-country road trip. Stay tuned for that. Anyway, time to see some other awesome roadside attractions in Paris, Tennessee. And at one of the major intersections is this sign here which says that Paris, Tennessee is the home of the world's biggest fish fry. 
Wait till you hear how much catfish is served at their annual fish fry. The annual fish fry festival takes place the last week in April, and during the festival they serve over six tons of catfish. They also hold something called a catfish race. I guess participants try to steer their fish to the finish line in the fastest time. The festival also features a parade, carnival rides, and a rodeo. I just noticed the seating area underneath the catfish sign, but the seat is facing the road and not the sign. That's kind of odd. You see the intersection as I get a view from the back. It could be people want to get a fun pick of the catfish while I'm seated. Anyone else hungry for fried catfish and hush puppies right about now? I can't tell how big this giant catfish is, but it looks pretty big to me. So let's head to downtown Paris to see what other restaurant attractions I can find. Now the downtown area and I find myself in one of the alleys. Paris and the sea has done something creative in their alleys. The city has placed a number of small painted murals in this alley and some other alleys in downtown. Also on the building is a replica of the Eiffel Tower. The art project is called Back Alley Paris. This definitely adds some color to an otherwise dull alley. The artwork shows scenes from Paris in the late 1800s, including some historic events like duels that led to the death of a prominent person. For example, this picture to the left of the Eiffel Tower shows a picture of a locomotive, with what looks like an entire town of Paris looking on. This representation was created by artist Dan Knowles and is called Journey Through Time and shows the importance of the railroad and the hardworking people of Paris from the 1800s to today. There are a couple of other small painted murals. On the left is another picture of people from Paris and a sea near the locomotive. And on the right, it looks like the entire population of Paris are celebrating the city's centennial. You see the Eiffel Tower on the right and a blimp flying in the sky. This rail is called Phantom of the Creed Opera House, also created by Dan Knowles. This recognizes the importance of entertainment in Paris. This rail includes several people of importance who have made so much happen for the community including Crete Mitchell, the first of their phantoms. There are also paintings on what used to be openings for windows that have been bricked over. Here's one window mural called Bloody Monday. It depicts a duel that took place on June 4th, 1888, where Will Edmonds was shot and killed at a saloon. The murderer was Kenny Porter, the son of former Tennessee Governor James Porter. I'm now in the downtown square, and lots of businesses and small restaurants along the bottom floor, and offices and residences take up the upper floors. Take a look at the county courthouse. It's an outbreak structure with four floors and a small brown dome above the clock. And since we've already seen the homage to Paris, Tennessee being the world's largest catfish fry, it makes sense to have a small catfish statue right here. There are several catfish statues around town. Paris has a population of a little over 10,000 people. Paris is the county seat of Henry County. In the short time I've been in the square, I've seen a few people get their picture in front of the city of Paris sign. It's the Christmas season when I'm filming this, and you can see the large round ornaments plus this white and red structure where I think Santa was stationed. Here's a mural pointing people to go down the alley to see their artwork. Two men shown in the mural are John Monroe and Dan Knowles. The small marker shows a quote and a brief resume from each man. Both are well-renowned artists from Paris, Tennessee, and Dan Knowles is also a musician. This picture shows a jeweler working on a wedding ring. Keep it at the top of the mural, 
And just so the jeweler is a couple purchasing the ring, the marker notes the couple got married in October of 1890. Also seen in the painting is the county courthouse and one row of buildings. Look at this mural. There are two dogs boarding a train. And you see the train drawn on the entire building. Also, the railroad tracks are painted down below. Along another alley, here's a painted mural compelling us to experience Paris. And this mural is that large catfish we saw on the sign just outside of downtown. There's Santa in his red and white house on the bottom right, and the county courthouse at the top right. And a row of buildings in the square on the top left. There are scenes in each of the letters in the word Paris. Yet another mural that we saw on the way out. Going clockwise, this one is the Eiffel Tower on the top left, the Long Bridge, a water tower, a big catfish, a guitar, and three white stars inside a blue circle which is seen on the Tennessee flag. Continuing westbound on a more quiet two-lane road to see what else we can find in western Tennessee. Just outside the city of Jackson is what looks like a treehouse taken right out of a fairy tale. Or maybe where the Keebler elves are busy making those yummy fresh stripes, E.L. fudge, and chips and lugs cookies that we all love. So I've gone from a city that makes a ton of fried catfish to this place where I'm hoping to get some cookies for dessert. I must be getting hungry, but I'm getting some of this barbecue later on. This is a tree stump where the owner added a roof, a fake door with a little porch leading to it, and a fake window complete with shutters. The tree was cut down in 2012, leaving just the stump. So instead of grinding down the stump, the owner created this awesome roadside attraction so tourists like myself can enjoy it. The tree stump house sits on a lot of acreage too. The actual house is way behind the tree stump house. Also notice there are spotlights plugged in and surrounding the tree stump. So the owner must light them up at night so this can be seen at night as well. I'm just hoping it's okay to walk on the owner's property and take some video. The tree stump house is northwest of the city of Jackson at the corner of Old Bells Road and Bells Highway. I found some parking at a church across the street and there was no way to pull over from this new road. Alright, the sun is about to set. Look at the beautiful sunset as I continue on Interstate 40 westbound. I'm heading to Memphis. I've heard good things about the barbecue in that city. And we're looking for a place that has some good ratings on Yelp. This would be a good way to wrap up a full day of driving across Tennessee. I'm in the suburb of Germantown at a place called the Commissary. The signs is they have World famous Memphis style barbecue that is so good you'll slap your mama. Yeah, if I slap my mama, I'll be thrown out of the house. But I am hungry, so let's see what they have. They have a large selection of appetizers such as barbecue nachos, pig skins, pig chips, smoked chicken wings. They also have smoked pork shoulder, beef brisket, and a hot link sausage. It works too for us folks from Georgia, fried catfish and shrimp, some sandwiches for their kids, also burgers, smoked chicken and turkey, and lots of variety of Boston salads. Lots of great sides to choose from, including barbecue beans, coleslaw, deviled eggs, and pig sticks. Oh, and the desserts. Definitely something for everyone. There's also new items on the menu, many different bologna sandwiches and plates, and an ultimate cheese plates with lots of stuff on it. So we're starting with these barbecue nachos. This has tortilla chips topped with nacho cheese and on top of them is a generous serving of smoked pulled pork of what looks like molasses barbecue sauce. We also got some jalapenos on the side. 
I'm super hungry and I'm ready to dig into these nachos. We should be getting our entrees in just a few minutes. I thought the nachos were okay. Plenty of cheese on them. Not a fan of the molasses though. Alright, so they brought out our dinner entrees and this is what we got. I got the smoked sliced beef biscuit and I got a side of macaroni and cheese and some green beans made southern style. So there's a little bacon in them and the meal came with a couple of these small square rolls. My mom got the pulled pork sandwich, the meat looks the same as what we got on the barbecue nachos and also has the same molasses sauce. She also got a side of macaroni and cheese, two double eggs, and a side of coleslaw. Plenty of food here, but wait till you see what my dad got. My dad ordered the gigantic cheese plate from the new part of the menu. For $17.95, this huge butter cake with smoked sausage, hickory smoked ham, bologna burn ends, a piece of cheddar and pepper jack cheese, which we forgot in the hotel fridge when we left the next day. Four double eggs, crackers, and some pickles. That's a tremendous amount of food, and we couldn't believe this whole thing cost 18 bucks. This could feed two people. So we made it to our hotel room. It's only 7.30 and I'm very, very tired. So as far as the restaurant goes, it was pretty eh. I had the brisket platter, which is basically like sliced brisket, with, and I got um, mac and cheese and green beans. The green beans were the best part of the entire platter. They did have a tad bit too much pepper because I was like sitting there and I was like, my mouth is on fire because they were spicy from the pepper and they were also still really, really hot. The mac and cheese, it could have been better. I mean, it was really cheesy, but it was also dry and so was the brisket and the sauce didn't really help. So mama got the pulled pork sandwich. She liked the meat, um, the, the pulled pork of the sandwich. But she said that the sauce was a little too molasses based. Dad seemed to get the better end of the stick. Um, he said, like he said that like his meat wasn't dry at all. The sausage was okay, but um, we actually ended up taking all the cube cheese and the crackers back to the hotel, and probably gonna have that with breakfast tomorrow. And that's it. I'm really tired and have a bit of a headache, and we have to get an early start tomorrow since we're driving through Arkansas. You see that? next time. Thanks for watching. Bye!